We've heard quite a bit about Cuba this week. Our president visited there, and a baseball team from America went there and played baseball in Cuba. And the Cuban people love baseball. I know that because I had the opportunity to visit there on two times and sit there and watch baseball games uh, in, uh, while the announcers were in Spanish. So I'm glad I understood the game because I certainly didn't understand the announcers. And I can tell that the picture's on the screen because I can see the smiles and the chuckles. This was from my first visit to Cuba, and, and it was in Havana. And uh, we, we saw these convertibles that were being used for taxis, and they would take you wherever you wanted to go, but also you could just pay a certain fee, and they would give you a half-hour ride around the city. And so uh, that's what we did. And I'm the guy with the smile and the hat. Uh, that's because I was an American. And I knew I was only there for the day in Havana and only for the week in Cuba, and I was coming back. But uh, the oppression that the people that live there have to put up with, that, that driver of that vehicle was a medical doctor. Now, I want you to use your imagination with me for a moment and imagine that you go to sleep one night and you wake up the next morning, and you're Pedro, the doctor who drives taxis to make a little extra money on the side. Because if you live in Cuba, and you're a doctor, you make $20 a month, just like all other Cuban workers, no matter what their jobs are, no matter how much they had to put into education or, or so on. Now, the government does pay for the education, but they decide whether or not you can be a doctor. Uh, and if you want to have a church, it has to be in your home. Very few churches have been uh, given permits to be built since the revelation, uh, re revolution back in uh, the late 50s. In 2012, the Wesleyan Church was given the very first building permit to, to build a, a church building at the national headquarters, but very few. If you want to have a church, you have to designate a section of your home, and that becomes the church, but you can't use it for anything else during the week. And the police watch you closely. Uh, your neighbors are paid to watch, make sure that you don't do anything. There's always a shortage of something uh, in any uh, socialist, communist country. And so that's the reality. What if it happened. Imagine what it would be like to wake up one day and have a totally different identity, live in a country where you don't have freedom. You can't even go from one state to another without a permit from the government. And they have blockades at the state lines and the vehicles are stopped and you have to show your permit to go from one state to another in that country. Well, tonight I want to talk to you about the mind of Christ from Philippians chapter 2. And I want us to notice that it says that Jesus was made in human likeness. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. We talk about this often at Christmas. It's, uh, the theological word is the incarnation, the birth of Jesus Christ. For all of eternity past, he was on the throne room of God. He, he was a spirit. He, he knew everything. He could be anywhere all the time, everywhere all the time. He had no limitations. The, the angels of heaven proclaimed his name and sang holy, holy, holy to him as the son of God. And one day, he became flesh and dwelt among us. One day, he limited himself to a human body. Not some great ruler, but to a helpless little baby, to a working family in, in Israel 
Now, there have been many men through the ages who have wanted to be God, but only one God who ever became man, and that is Jesus Christ. The pharaohs of Egypt made people worship them as God. The kings of Babylon promoted themselves as being God. The emperors of Rome said, I am God. And even in more recent history, Sun Young Moon and David Koresh and others wanted people to believe that they are God. They were men who wanted to be God. But there's only one God who ever became man, Jesus Christ. He humbled himself. Jesus left the throne room of God and became limited to the realities of a human body. We're familiar with those limitations. We can only be one place at a time. We only have limitations of strength. We know what hunger is, what thirst is, what pain is, what sickness is. Jesus became flesh and limited himself to a human body for us. That would have been quite sobering had the Apostle Paul stopped with that. But actually, if you read the verses before that, he's even more pointed in what he says to us. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only at your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And as I was preparing for this evening and and preparing for this message, I, I began to think about the hurts just within our congregation. If this were a Sunday morning and all of our congregation were here, we would find people who have experienced the death of a spouse. When our widow's ministry gets get together, there's 13, 14, 15 ladies from our church who have experienced the death of their husbands. And then there's many men who have also experienced the death of their wives. I've heard Woody Ream say, whose wife passed away some 20, 25 years ago, I think of her every day. I miss her every day. How would we relate to someone if we had the mind of Christ? If we treated them, we should look not only on our own interests, but on the interests of others as well. And then there are those who have broken marriage relationships. There are those who are carrying burdens for rebellious children and grandchildren. There are those who have received a cancer diagnosis and are experiencing the the terror and the torture of cancer treatments. There are those who are going through surgical procedures and medical procedures. (coughs) There are those who have experienced severe injury and permanent disabilities. There are those who have experienced job loss and and, um, can't find a job. I just spoke to someone just within the last couple weeks that I worked at the same place for 14 years. I was in, up into management, and one day they came in and said, we sold out, and we're going out of business. And after all of his loyalty and all of his work, he was without a job. There are many who face financial crises. There are those who are stuck in t- toxic work environments. There are those who, uh, a young couple in, in our church who, who desired adoption and, and were matched up with a, a a person, and and when the time came, they thought, this is the day that our baby's been born. The birth mother said, I'm going to take care. I'm going to keep my baby, and the great disappointment that came. Just before the service tonight, a lady was talking to me uh, this evening about how the, the relationship between her and her brother and there's court cases and all kinds of things like this that are, that are taking place. When, when Jesus left heaven, he came 
and put himself in our place. And Paul says, if we've gotten anything from that relationship, any encouragement, any strength, anything that you have gained from that relationship, then have the same mind. Look at the needs of others. And I'm just talking within our own congregation. That's not our community and our city and, and, and our nation and people around the world. To not only put ourselves in our own struggles, but in the struggles that others have as well. And then the third thing that we, note, that we notice is that it wasn't enough for Jesus to leave the throne room of God and become a human being. He humbled himself and became nothing. But then it says he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And some people may say, well, he knew he would rise again. He, he knew that God was in control. But would you like to hang on a cross the way Jesus did? No matter what you know is coming next, the pain, the suffering, the agony, the humiliation, all that went along with it. In Philippians 2.8, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. <coughs> Excuse me. Even death on a cross. Crucifixion was an ancient method of execution in which the victim's hands and feet were bound and nailed to a cross. It was one of the most horribly painful and disgraceful methods of capital punishment. The word crucifixion means, it comes from the Latin word crucifixio or crucifixus, and it means fixed to a cross. Crucifixion was not only one of the most disgraceful forms of death, it was one of the most dreaded methods of execution in the ancient world. Ancient or accounts of crucifixions are recorded among early civilizations. This type of capital punishment was primarily reserved for traitors and captive armies and slaves and the worst of criminals. Crucifixion became common under the rule of Alexander the Great between 300 and 400 years before the birth of Christ. Doctors who have studied the Bible's description of his death say that the pain would have been excruciating. In fact, the word excruciating means out of the cross. Jesus literally defined the worst pain that anyone could feel. God laid the sins of the world on Jesus. Beyond his physical suffering, the, the burden of our sins, and then he sacrificed him as the one and only lamb. It was time for the Passover. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He took all that pain to, to fully pay the price so that we could be forgiven. We cannot take lightly the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. And so if you're here tonight and you feel nobody loves me, nobody cares, I want you to know this evening, there is one who took your burden of sin to Calvary. He was God in the flesh, and he laid down his life for your sins. If you have not yet this evening asked Jesus to be your Savior and chosen to be a follower of his, I would encourage you, as we watch this brief video, to ask Jesus to forgive your sin and to be your Savior.
Let's stand together as we close our time together with prayer. Our Lord, we come before you tonight humbled by your great love that you would humble yourself and become a human being, that you would humble yourself and become obedient to the cross, that you would suffer and bleed and die for us, for our sins. Lord, those of us who know you as Savior, We have received such blessing, such encouragement from knowing you as our Savior. Help us, dear Lord, to have your heart and your mind toward others, that we we would care about their needs like you care about our needs. May we humble ourselves before our brothers and sisters. And Lord, if there's anyone who has not yet asked Jesus to be their Savior, I pray that you would help them to confess their sin to you, that they would repent and turn away from their sin and ask you to forgive their sin and be their Savior and choose today to follow you the remaining days of their life so that they can spend eternity with you in heaven. May you be with us as we leave this place. And Lord, as we gather again on the Lord's Day, on Easter Sunday morning, may we be reminded of the great hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.